evening. Oh, Lion got to go home and take him some rest. Yeah, you now I got to pick that white man's cotton. You know it's going to be just a solid test. Out of the emancipation of African American slaves following the Civil War, birthed the system reflective of the power and ownership whites exercised over blacks known as sharecropping. This system grew from the struggle between planters and ex-slaves on how to organize production. In the mid-19th century, white farmers began to explore the South for fertile farmland. The slaves they brought with them performed the hard work that would turn the Delta into the richest cotton farming land in the country. The Mississippi Delta became among one of the most reactionary and repressive areas for African Americans. Following the Civil War, the Mississippi Delta was the last area settled in the South where blacks lived with the daily and ever-present threat and reality of violence. Sharecropping and cotton production became synonymous with the Southern economy in Mississippi. In the sharecropping system, sharecroppers worked in a assigned section of plantation land, while the landowner provided tenants with housing, food, seed, fertilizer, and farm equipment from the plantation owner's company store, usually at outrageously high interest rates, and took half or more of the crop. This system replaced slavery as a cheap source of labor. Following 1865, white southern landowners implemented the sharecropping system in the Delta and kept it in place by an unjust political and economic system that exploited the labor of sharecroppers. This system, in conjunction with segregation, allowed for the exploitation of black workers by white farmers and landowners by providing a steady and docile supply of socially subordinate cheap labor, a labor force that controlled by low wages and a lack of legal protections. Sharecropping families worked from around 5 a.m. until dusk with a short break for remedial dinner. Families were pinched together in the cotton fields, which ensured that the bitter taste of slavery remained forever embedded in the mouths of black people. Donnell Harrell, who was born into the sharecropping family in Clarkstown, Mississippi during the early 20th century, recalls the exploitative nature of picking cotton for white farm owners. Quote, Now I pick cotton here in the hills. Gee whiz. Used to get up in the morning to the field about 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock, be in the field, pick cotton till 4 o'clock, and leave walking. At that time you were getting maybe $2, 100 for picking cotton. That would have been any time between 50, 51, 52. Quote, Stories of the laborious work of black sharecroppers as well as the exploitative nature of white farm owners were passed down from generation to generation. When asked to recall the stories of his grandmother, Donna Harrow remembers the arduous work his ancestors endured. Quote, now she was not a slave, but her parents had come through slavery. But during her time, they were sharecroppers, and she told the stories of how hard they worked. And then at the end of the year, when it came time for the settlement, they got little or nothing. Many families didn't even clear anything, were told things like, Well, you almost made it this time, maybe next year. One more crop and you'll make some money. And that never materialized. Quote, it was almost impossible for sharecroppers to clear their debts with landlords. At the end of each year, sharecroppers had to settle accounts by paying what they owed, such as land, tools, food, and shelter, usually with high interest rates. The plantation owners kept track of the calculations and would often cheat the workers out of an honest pay. Most sharecroppers were uneducated and could not properly count. However, most were aware that they were being cheated. Families were simply grateful to have a roof over their heads, even if they were being robbed blind by their landlords. Nettie Greer, who was born into a sharecropping family during the early 1900s in the Mississippi Delta, recalls the unfairness of the payment system in sharecropping. Quote, Then he took his share. If you were half share or fourth share, he took his share. He took what you owed him. 
Now, not every landlord was honest, and there was nothing you could do, because if that black sharecropper could find a lawyer, who was going to go against his lawyer? So you could see, you just had to take it. And if he had a tenant that gave him trouble or was lazy and didn't work the land, he'd put him off in place in December. He'd have to go find somewhere to live. Then he had worked the whole year and had no money. And you had crooked landlords who would just take, you know, they were doing the figuring so it wasn't for what the tenant got. Quote, the low wages and lack of adequate health care led to the high rates of nutritional diseases, malnutrition, ill health, and early death among African American sharecroppers and tenants. Children born into sharecropping families were severely exploited. Dr. Elsie Dorsey, who grew up in a sharecropping family in the Mississippi Delta in Sunflower County, could recall not understanding the laborious work she had to perform every day and why her family reaped such insignificant rewards. Quote, I didn't understand why people sat down and went to sleep immediately after sitting down. Like we got run out the field with the shower. A few minutes after we were out, all of the adults would be asleep. And I couldn't understand why they would be so asleep. I remember asking the question about that and not understanding just chronic fatigue. Where these people worked so hard that they had just run down and they were constantly tired needing sleep. As an adult with some understanding about the psychology and the mental burden of living in the Delta, I'm sure some of them were also depressed. Quote, African Americans during the 19th and early 20th centuries often felt they had no choice but to accept the injustices of sharecropping or else be subjected to the punishment implemented by the system of white supremacy. They were well aware of the consequences that lie ahead for being a disobedient nigger. These punishments can include a number of unjust treatments whose main purpose was to make an example out of those blacks that dared to act out, including lynching. The act of lynching is the illegal execution of an accused person by a mob. In a study done by sociologist Jane Hillegas, out of the 268 people reported lynched in Mississippi during the 35 years following the Civil War, 221 were black, 35 were white, and the race of 12 are unknown. According to another study done by T.J. Wolfter, Jr., for the Southern Commission on the Study of Lynching, there is a correlation between the total number of lynchings in the United States to the value of cotton per acre during the years 1900 to 1930. The incidences of lynching seem to decrease as the dollar value of cotton per acre rose. In other words, when cotton land was more valuable, fewer people were lynched. The fear of being destitute homeless, or even lynch deterred action from within the black sharecropping community. However, as jobs opened up in northern and western cities, millions of blacks migrated, leaving the south, the cotton fields, and sharecropping behind. After 1940, about 5 million blacks left, creating the second great migration north. The black-owned newspaper, the Chicago Defender, even went as far as to urge blacks to migrate and lobbied railroads to offer group rates for travelers which had a direct route to Mississippi. After the end of World War II, mechanization threw sharecroppers off the cotton farms. The combination of mechanization and black migration north put an end to the sharecropping system by the 1960s, though some forms of tenant farming still existed throughout the 21st century. However, the system of sharecropping ensured that the injustices and inequalities reminiscent of slavery remain in place for at least a hundred years after the Civil War. The combination of controlled low wages and scarce opportunity for legal protections led to the acceptance of the exploitative system. The cries of millions of African American families across the Jim Crow South went unheard as their labor was exploited to build this country we call America.